Our scripture reading is found in Timothy, I'm sorry, Titus, Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. And it reads, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing by, of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Chuck. Well, good morning, church. I feel good this morning. I don't know why that is, but I do. The good news is that it's sunny, and the bad news, it was 102 at 10 o'clock. So anyway, but uh, great day, huh? Good to see you with us this morning. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Uh, Father, as we come to the throne of grace, we come boldly, and we come with confidence because we know you care for us. And we pray today as we talk about a very basic but important message, the foundation of our faith, that you'll be with us today, that the Holy Spirit will be present. And your glory may be magnified, and we ask it in Jesus' name, and for his sake, amen. You know, I, uh, I like to reminisce, and they say as you get older, reminisce becomes a form of entertainment. It's also cheaper, uh, and so forth, and I see I do it more than more. Where's Bob at? He was reminiscing all morning on Sabbath school. Where is he? There, where is that? All right. Well, you know, one time in one of our prayer sessions, we have a group meeting on Friday night. We are talking about our best times as a child. And uh, we were talking about the character of building years, what they say is anywhere from one to five to one to 10 years. And I couldn't remember five and below. So I began to give my experience between the ages of five and 10. We lived in the state of Iowa which, as I mentioned before, is some people think is the capital of some state. Uh, but it truly is a state. Now, I was born there, and uh, we had moved out in the country about eight miles south of Perry, Iowa. Anybody know where Perry, Iowa is? Uh, does anybody know where Iowa is? Oh, so there, we, there we go. Okay, good. And uh, there was a school out there called Washington Township. It was a grades 1 through 12. My father was a custodian there. There was only one to take care of that school. He also drove a bus in the evening, take the kids home. And uh, my mother was a nurse's aide. And um, we lived out there in the country. It was surrounded by cornfield, just that school. Across the street was my father's well, home. And uh, that was part of the compensation for uh, being a custodian there at the school. And um, it was a simple life. But you know what, I treasure that life. Because you know, you could yell and scream, you could jump all over the place, you could walk forever and nobody heard you. Okay, you know what's beautiful in a cornfield? Well, not a lot, but uh, you know, it's just the simple things in life. I, we forget that sometimes. You know, we're surrounded by voicemail and tweeting and cell phones and television and I mean the distractions that we have today is almost unbearable when we compare with what I had back in the early 50s. And as I said before, it was a very simple life, a school, work and play. I, when I was seven years old, I was my oldest sister who was five years older than me, it was six, we would go to the school at night after classes, and we would work till almost 9.30. Dad could not do it all by himself. There were 12 grades, if you can imagine, sweeping floors and everything. We would come home, and we had uh, a very late supper. We called it, I don't know, anybody know what supper is? Is that a, millenniums probably think it's some kind of food, but uh, it's actually a meal. So we had breakfast, dinner, and supper, and then we'd go to bed. And um, it was a wonderful experience for me. I never forgot that. But when we talk about the spiritual life, I must tell you that I had very little input. My parents, uh, my parents never attended church. Um, we didn't have prayer in our home. We had, did not have family devotions. Um, but uh, my folks did teach us 
moral living. They taught us good work ethics. And, but religion, as you might know it, was an unknown product uh, in my life at that age. Jesus did not exist as far as I was concerned. And that was probably two of my sisters as well. Now, you know, for entertainment, we um, basically would go to town once a week. And Pilly, Iowa was about 8,000 people, okay, and so forth. Some churches have higher membership than that. And we'd go then. What did we do? Well, the folks would shop, and we'd walk behind them and look at the things that we wanted that we knew we could not buy. And, uh, you know, they always say women are good about window shopping. I gained that habit at seven. And I can tell you that we thought that was a great thing. And the biggest thing is we could have a big bag of popcorn we paid, my parents paid 15 cents for. We thought that was fabulous. We thought that was great. Oh, we get popcorn today. You know, we can actually buy it in a bag. And then... Occasionally, and I am, I mean, I'm stretching that a little bit, occasionally we would go to town on Sunday. And on those occasions, my mother and father would say to me and my older sister, we want you to go to church. Well, not really not church, Sunday school. We thought, oh, no, it's got to be something better. And they said, no, you're going to Sunday school. Uh, that wasn't a suggestion. That was somewhat of a command. And so we went to the Methodist church. I remember the stairs going up there. It looked like Mount Everest by the time you get up there. You know, at seven years old, everything looks big. So we went into Sunday school, and uh, I didn't know anybody. And um, after it was over, we didn't stay for church. My folks came, came by and, and picked us up. I got my first Bible, though, in the uh, Methodist church, and it was the Revised standard version. Not the new one, but the first one. And that was my first Bible. I don't know what happened to that. My wife and I had it when I was in the military, and we were up Moses Lake, and I had it in the back seat of the car, and apparently it fell out, and I lost my first Bible. I have something else to show you a little bit later, but I lost my first Bible. Now, our family in general, our cousins and uncles, grandma and grandpa, and other friends, they pretty much had a religious experience like we did, basically none, except for one uncle and one aunt. Omi and Earl were their name. They were very faithful and active members of the Southern Baptist Church. They never came to many of the celebrations and the holidays that we celebrated, because the whole family would come and we'd have dinner together, but rarely were they there. And I don't know why. Very nice people. I don't know if they weren't invited or not. Our family didn't speak much about them. So we would go over there rarely, but we would go over. And Earl would have grace for the meal. He wasn't overbearing, but he talked about his faith. And... Uh, some of our relatives didn't go over there for that reason, and so forth. But one day, it was on a Thursday night, my mother gets a call from Omi, and she says, Doreen, my mother's name, you know, we'd like to have you come and attend a meeting at the church. You and I would call it an evangelistic crusade. And so mother didn't really want to go, but she didn't want to hurt her feelings. She said, okay, sure, we'll go. And she made the announcement in the house, and we all had some form of depression uh, and so forth. And so we went. We went. Seven years old, and I'm sitting in there listening to this sermon because I didn't want to go with the children's group. So I'm sitting with my mother and my dad and my oldest sister, and I don't remember much about that sermon, and in, fair, and in fairness to the evangelist, um, I could only relate to what I remember. And he was talking about Jesus saves, Jesus saves. But I don't remember that very well. All I remember is he began to talk about, um, probably three, three quarters of the way through his sermon, he began to talk about 
What happens when you don't accept God's grace? And he said, I want to tell you, brethren, and I want to tell you now. The fires of hell are hotter than you think. And he said, I want to tell you in that day when the brethren will be sending in heaven, looking down upon those people as they suffer and yell in anguish for eternity. I could tell you I could feel the heat coming right up through my chair. And at first, I had fear. But unfortunately, later on, it turned to anger. And I'm going to come back to that story, so just hold that for a moment. About three weeks before then, we get a notice on our door, and this is in the summer, and it says a small community church out there near Perry was having vacation Bible school. And uh, my mother said to me, uh, I know you're working with your dad. I was driving a tractor at seven. Uh, ac that acreage that, that, that school's on was like 10 acres. So I'm driving this tractor and I'm helping dad scrub floors, getting ready for the new school year. Anyway, my mother says, you know what? I think you should attend that vacation Bible school. Oh, not again. We already, uh, you know, we already went to church about six weeks ago. And she says, is that enough? You know? So, no, she said, I want you to go. This is, my sister didn't have to go. What is this women thing? You know, they get all the breaks. I got to go, and so forth. So, anyway, I went to Vacation Bible School. Kill, do you have that? Uh, like I can have for a moment? And, uh, you know, I, can, well, I remember the song we sang at the beginning, at the end, was called Something About Christian Soldiers. Onward, Christian Soldiers. I looked around, I said, these people aren't in the military. What's the deal? Uh, you know? So we, uh, we sang that song. I had no clue what was going on. And so they put me in wood burning. And to be very frank with you, that's pretty much what it was. And so at the end of five days, this was the end result of my wood burning experience. This was 1952. And it says, can you read it? God is love. Verse John, chapter 4, verse 8. And I took that home, and I put it on my wall. It's amazing. I still have this thing. It looks about as bad as it did when I made it. But it's the best I could do. Going back to the sermon. I thought about that, and as I later in life, I thought about, you know, this is a reverse of the Romans sitting in the Colosseum, eating their popcorn and hamburgers, watching the lions tear apart Christians. Christians sitting in heaven enjoying the spectacle. How in the world could we ever love God? We're told that many will never come to the throne of grace because of that doctrine. We as Christian people have an obligation to share the truth about God. Don't you agree? Relationships cannot be built on that type of foundation. And don't get me wrong. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Would you not agree? But God has the right way to deal with sin. Billy Graham's wife, in a time of frustration, once said, if Jesus doesn't come soon, he'll have to apologize for Sodom and Gomorrah. I'll tell you right now, don't we sometimes feel that way now? We have a time of trouble coming that's coming, and it's coming now. We're seeing it with our own eyes. We need a message of hope. We need a message that says that Jesus saves. In John, the third and fourth chapter, we read about John and Peter walking through the temple about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which was the time of prayer. And there was a lame man sitting at the temple gate called Beautiful. And he was asking for funds as he'd done from his youth up. And when John and Peter approached him, he asked the same thing. And Peter looked at him and he said, look at me. And he got his attention. And he said, gold and silver I do not have, but what I do have I will give you. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he reached down and he grabbed that man's hand and he pulled him up. Strength entered his legs, his ankles, and his feet. 
And the man walked through the temple praising God. And the people who knew him, and many did, were awestruck. They couldn't believe it. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Well, the uh, temple gods and the Sadducees who were standing around didn't really appreciate that. Plus, they were talking about the resurrection. And that, that's no good either when you're a Sadducee. And so they arrested them, but since it was late in the day, they could not bring them before the Sanhedrin. So the next morning, they did take them there. And the leaders then said, well, by what power was this man healed? And Peter, in essence, said this, it is by the name of Jesus Christ that this cripple was healed. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mortals by which a man can be saved. I did not come to argue today, Peter was saying. I came to make an announcement. And that announcement is this, that Jesus saves. A person is drowning in a pool and a lifeguard jumps in and takes him out. The man goes from death to life. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And Paul and Silas were in the Philippian jail. And they were singing praises to God. And as this jailer, head jailer was listening, he could hear about the wonderful things God had done in their life. And then there was a terrible earthquake. And the cells opened, and the prisoners came out, and the jailer thought, well, I'm going to kill myself because I'll tell you what, if I don't do it, they will if my prisoners escape. And Paul and Silas says, no, don't do that. We're not going anywhere. And the man was impressed. And he'd heard the message, and he asked the question, what must I do to be saved? We hear that all through the New Testament. Unfortunately, I've heard too many times that the word saved is a bad word. I will tell you, it is the word. It is the declaration of the New Testament. And we need to hear it more, not less. And so, salvation is the life force of our faith. It is central to Christianity. We talk about the three angels' message, and what do we talk about? Babylon and the mark of the beast and so forth. That's important. But the very first part of our message is most important, that God is the creator and we worship him because he is. But we worship him because he saves. We come to God because we recognize that he loves us and that he cares for us. Just where we are. He doesn't wait for us to get better. He doesn't wait for us to say nice things. He takes us as we are, and then he wants to mold us, as we did our children, as we raised them. And so the jailer made that statement, and you know what happened? He went home, he fixed them a meal, he washed their wounds, and the whole family was saved. What? Well, wait a minute, hold on here. Have they, let's go down the list. Have we make sure they've done everything. They were saved. Because they believed Jesus' promise that if you accept him by faith, you have a saving relationship with him. I can't tell us and tell you how critical that is. What does it mean to be saved? First of all, salvation is a very personal thing. It's not a group project. Number two, it's a born-again experience. And number three... And most important, it is blessed assurance. Salvation is of those three components. I won't read the Bible text this morning that George read in Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. But it says that rebirth, salvation, forgiveness, the gift of the Holy Spirit, all those things are gifts that God gives us if we receive them. That's a hard thing to do. Not so much for children. It's a tough thing for adults. We want to pay our way. The way we were raised. Whether you were in a Christian home or not. The way we were raised. You don't get to where you are unless you have your own effort. You do your own thing. It's the only way it works. Jesus said, unless you come like little children, you'll never inherit the kingdom of God. You know why I said that? 
He said that because children are dependent. They recognize the weakness. They recognize they need hope. They need help. We as adults sometimes don't. Yet all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We find in John 1, 12 to 13, children are not bo- that were not born of natural descent or a husband's will or a human decision, but born of God. Isn't it nice to be in the family? When we're in the family, we have privileges that others don't have. And God wants us in the family. That's his will. And so when Peter was giving his sermon at Pentecost, it was somewhat long and lengthy, he went through the history of Israel. He talked about Jesus and what he had done and his great love for us, that while we were yet sinners, he died for them and and for us. And then they said, as they heard this, and he said, you crucified this man. You crucified our Lord and our Messiah. And it said they were taken at heart. All of a sudden, they recognized in their own minds through the power of the Spirit what they had done, what they had participated in. They said, brother, what should we do? And he said, repent, meaning a change of heart, a change of mind. You can't change your heart, and you can't change your mind. Repentance is not a human act. It is a God act. The Bible says that repentance is a gift given to Israel. It's given to you and I. We can't even repent on our own. Repent, and that's what they were doing. What can we do? Good question. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you know what? I'm going to give you not only the gift of forgiveness, I'm going to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank God for that. We know what it's like to try to live the Christian life. And I'm going to talk to you very briefly today that living the Christian life, being empowered by the carnal nature. Did you know that that was possible? You can live an outward Christian life being empowered by the spirit of the devil. You believe that? We're going to talk about it because the Bible gives us plenty of, plenty of examples. John Wesley You know, the Seventh-day Adventist church, his belief on salvation comes directly to the Wesley philosophy. John Wesley was a great theologian. He was the founder of the Methodist church. And if you want to read something on assurance of salvation, you should read books by John Wesley. He says this, Before a child is born into the world, he has eyes, but he sees not. He has ears, but he doesn't hear He has a voice, but he can't speak. He has lungs, but he does not breathe. And then a child is born. He sees the light. He hears the sound. He takes a breath. And he begins to experience love in a whole new dimension. Wesley says and goes on to say, when we are born in the Spirit, we see with new eyes, we see with new ears, we believe with new minds, we love with new hearts, we live a life and move experience from a whole different perspective. Give yourself credit. When we become Christians, you know, I did, I thought, well, I'm perfect now. Sin won't be a problem. That took about 15 and a half minutes. I found out that the carnal nature is still there. And this is where we run into problems as adults. How do we deal with that? The third thing that salvation is a blessed assurance. We were giving a Bible study, Carol and I, in Glendale, California, over at the Glendale Church many, many years ago. And there was a lady that wanted a Bible study, so we we gave that to her. She lived in a small trailer, uh, trailer house. And every week we would come, and she was really open to the words. She had had a previous experience in another Christian church. And as we went through that, she just grasped that. She ate that like candy. And, and we went through it, and everything really went well. And she accepted Jesus as her personal Savior. And she just followed right along, and we baptized her. And she said, it's the most wonderful experience in my life. It should be. 
It should be. And about three or four weeks later, in a short time, we were in church where he didn't see her. And I'll call her Beth for now. That wasn't her name, but we'll just use that. And uh, after church, we seen her standing at, the, at one of the exits, and she really looked depressed. She was down. And so uh, we went over to her and said, Beth, I said, is there something wrong? And she, she dropped her head, and she said, I really don't belong in this church anymore. I said, what are you saying? We all have habits and issues when we come to Jesus, and they're still there after we're baptized, and he wants to work with us to groom us and mold us into his image. She had had a habit of smoking. Now, I want to tell you right now, smoking is not the worst thing you can ever do. Pride's worse. He's smoking, you can identify. And uh, she said, I started smoking again. I'm, I'm lost. Jesus has left me. Is that the way it works? Is that what happens? We make a mistake and God boots us out of the family? Is that how it works? I've got good news for you today. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. What this woman needed was blessed assurance. An idea of that is um, I have a grandson who's actually going to ASU this year, the freshman year, just graduated. When he was very small, one of the, during those character building years, I was with him on a Tuesday afternoon, and I had some work to do on my desk, but I took some time, and he wanted me to order a couple of songs uh, and so forth out of iTunes. And so I went in, and he's watching me, and I put my security code in on mine and went in and so forth. About an hour later, I'm at the desk. I'm working on the computer, and he comes in, and his head is drooping. And I said, Max, what's the matter? And he said, I've done something wrong. I said, well, what's that? He says, Grandpa, I took your security code and I, or your password, and I ordered three or four songs. And he dropped his head. You know, Max told me years later that he never wanted to disappoint me. And I know that feeling. I had a father the same way. I never wanted to disappoint him. So I said, Max, come here. And I set him on my lap, and I said, you know, Max, I'm disappointed that you did that. But you know something? It took an awful lot of courage to come here and tell me that. And, you know, Jesus helps us to do those kind of things. And then I whispered in his ear, let's go have a milkshake. God is a rewarder of those who seek him. And I think of that, and I think of this woman in Glendale. God's disappointed when we fall and when we slip, when we violate his will. But like grandpa to his grandson, he still loves him. He still cares for him. The fact that he even came forward and admitted is an indication that he felt badly about it. And we need to understand if when people claim that you make a saving statement, that you're being, you know, uh, somewhat... Um, well, I, I'll use another term later, but you're making an incorrect statement. I'll tell you this. When you come in and become part of the family of God, it's more difficult than you think to walk away. God does not leave you. And for this woman, we got her in a five-day smoking span. We went back with her, and I asked her, are you praying? And you know what she said? Once I knew that I was lost, I stopped doing what? She stopped praying. You see the danger of that? She stopped studying scripture. That's where her strength is. When we are at the bottom of the tubes, that's the time for sure that we need to be at the throne of grace. Don't you not agree? It's not the occasional good or bad deed that we do. It's how close we walk with Jesus that makes a difference. You know what it's like to have a religious experience. You go to a camp meeting. You go to an evangelistic campaign. Or as a student, you go through a week of prayer, and you come out 
I'm ready to go. Man, I tell you, I'm alive. Two weeks later, you're saying, Phew, what happened? Okay? Some of it, a lot of it is an emotional experience. Feelings don't last. We get into the nitty-gritty of life and issues and problems that come up. Feelings have a way of dissipating, do they not? John Wesley lived and preached the doctrine of Christian assurance. They say he never, ever gave a sermon that did not include Christian assurance, that God's love. Now, you know, he had a habit. I remember, I think at the EUB church we did this. We had a call every, every Sunday. We did not have a church service that we did not have a call. Not once. And then he'd have a call sometimes for those who feel that they could improve on their experience. We all would have to come forward then, right? And whether we should do that more or not is a matter of conjecture. But the point is we never want to forget that God's invitation to us to come to him is all the time. He wants us to come. And he wants us to come with our needs. Any man that cometh unto me, I will in no wise do what? Cast out. And so John Wesley repeated Romans 8.16. He said, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. When the devil whispers in your ear, I have doubts at times. It could be because there's a sin I need to deal with. But it could be also that Satan just whispering in my ear, God, you're not good enough. Well, I accepted this because I wasn't good enough, right? And he's wishing, he wants to defeat the very premise and the very foundation for which you are a Christian. If he can pull the rug out there and you continue to go to church and prayer meeting and all that, it doesn't make any difference to him. You can be a satanic Christian. Excuse the term. And I'm going to tell you why. Is it possible to be worldly and be a Christian? Anybody want to try that one? Is it possible to be worldly and be a Christian? The Bible answers that. Let's try it. Second missionary journey of Paul. He's at the church of Corinth. His first visit. And here's what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Brothers and sisters. Now, when somebody calls you brother and sister, what does that mean? You're kind of in the family, right? Everybody agree? Brothers and sisters, he says. Let's finish it. I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit. Now, I wonder if Pastor Jay was up here this morning. He said, you know, you people aren't living by the Spirit. Jim Cady says, don't get personal and probably the rest of us. You're not living by the Spirit. We might be offended by that. And they may have been. But you're living as people who are still worldly. You're infants in Christ. Now what does that tell us? It tells us these are people who still believe in Jesus. Maybe he's still praying some. Maybe still studying some. But the carnal nature is ruling the roost and not the spirit. And Paul says, let me tell you the danger of that. I gave you milk, not solid food. What he's saying is, I gave you the foundation, the gospel. You accepted it. And then I wanted to give you solid food. You know, the King James says meat, but us Adventists changed it to solid food. Uh, and so forth. I'm kidding. But uh, in essence, he says, look, you need to grow. You need to mature. God is not concerned about your perfection. He's concerned about you maturing as a Christian. And he wants it motivated by love. I'm going to repeat this now and I'll repeat it again. We say, well, we're commandment-keeping people. God wants us to be commandment keepers. That's not quite correct. Jesus said, if you love me, then what? Keep the commandments. If he had left that part out, 
There are many examples in the Bible of people who had external beliefs and they kept the commandments. We'll give you a couple examples. But they weren't Christians. We're told that wicked people, people who are not saved, can do very benevolent things. When it really comes right down to it, benevolence is important. But if it's not with Jesus' power, it doesn't mean a thing. Ted Turner said once in a USA interview, when you look in the mirror in the morning, you're looking at the Savior. Nobody is going to save you but yourself. You may say it's nonsense, but you know what? Too many of us at times live that life in the Christian faith. We are a Savior. We would not admit it. But our life's path indicates otherwise. Nobody's going to save you but yourself. Mr. Turner, you're wrong. Salvation is dependent upon us. We might as well all go home. Christians cannot save themselves. We get the power from God that will give us the power to do things that we can't do. We, should have, we know that, don't we? We've realized that in our experience. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, without trust, without looking to Jesus, it is impossible to please God. For we must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Remember, we don't, we don't seek God for reward. Well, I, that's not my testimony. I came to God because he had something to offer. How about you? He has something to offer you and I. For those who diligently seek him, that is the work God asks us to do, to continue walking with him. As you first come to Christ, Colossians 2.6, so walk in him. As you accepted him by grace and by his promise, you live that life all the way through the same way. No different. And so in 1 John 5, verse 13, if somebody says you shouldn't be professing, if somebody comes up to you and says, are you saved? I don't see that much anymore. But sometimes people do. Maybe a good Southern Baptist might ask us that. Are you saved? And you know what? You can answer with assurance. Because of my life in Jesus, I'm saved. You can safely, without presumption, make that statement. Jesus said, you know what, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off a branch that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Ultimately, God, if he doesn't see fruit in us, the time may come when we lose our salvation. It's possible. But not by God, it's possible by us. And so Jesus said, there's a way to avoid that. Remain in me as I remain in you. He also says all that he will prune that tree. He'll prune that branch. That's maturing in Christ. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What is fruit? The Sabbath is not fruit. The state of the dead is not fruit. Fruit is love, goodness, kindness. God says, I want to develop a love like I have in you. Then when you obey the commandments, you will obey them for the right reason. When you have the power of God empowering you to obey, you will not be judgmental. Those who lived to keep the commandments in order that they might just please God and be saved are usually judgmental, they are hard, and they are deprived of love. That is a terrible, terrible experience, and I can tell you probably most of us at one time or the other have had that experience. And finally, very quickly, one of the great stories of the Bible 
a young, rich Yulu comes to Jesus. And he has a question to ask. And he says this, what must I do to get to heaven? We all want to know that. What must we do to get to heaven? And he addressed them as a good teacher, the first mistake. Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. You see, Jesus played with this man based upon his theology, and he asked questions based upon his theology, not true theology. And so he corrects him first of all, and he says, look, if I'm just a man, even a good man, from a perspective of I'm very religious, I keep the commandments, I love people, that doesn't make me good. But that's how the rich young ruler looked at it, that if you did enough right things, you could be classified as good. And so he looked at Jesus that way, the way he looked at himself. That would, should have been a signal to him about the inadequacy of his question. Entry in heaven is not determined by what we do, but what Christ has done for us. If we think we get frequent flyer points because of the good things that we do, we'll be greatly mistaken. If Christ has come into our life and we're growing with him, we're spending time with him, and that the tragedy in the Christian church today, which for all of us is a threat, is that less Christians are studying the Bible than ever before. Jesus said, you think by studying the scriptures you have eternal life, but the scriptures testify of me. When we study the scriptures to know Jesus, there will be results. There is no question about it, don't give up. So why would we study the word less? And number two is, Prayer, the power of the soul, we are told, to talk to God as we would talk to a friend and to spend time in his word. That's what Christianity is all about. We don't try to work harder to please God. We try to work harder to get to know him and let him empower us to do the right thing. And so when Jesus said and he asked, what should I do? Jesus played into his theology. And here's what he said. Keep the commandments. Thou shalt commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. Thou... Oh, not a problem. I've been doing that from my youth up. Wow, that's a, great, that's a great answer. That's what I would have come up with. And then Jesus complimented him in another way. There's only one thing you lack. You know, when I was in school, and my teacher would come up to me and say, there's only one thing missing. That's pretty good for me. And the rich man's probably thinking, oh, I know what it's going to be. He, he, he probably is going to want a little money. I got plenty of money. I can write that check now. Oh, maybe it won't be money. Maybe it'll be being head of the Pathfinder. Since Dan quit, we need somebody to replace him. Okay? Or maybe it's leading a youth group. That's good. Or maybe teaching Sabbath school. That's not bad either. I'm ready. I, I'm ready to take it. Come on, throw it at me. And Jesus said, what I want you to do is to sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and to follow me. Now, some people hear that because Jesus later said that how difficult it is for a rich man to get into heaven, and the disciples couldn't believe it. But we need to read the whole thing. The man's downfall was not his money. Did you know that Jesus only one time Asked for someone to give up all their possessions, and it was this situation. Never before and never after. It wasn't money that was the issue. God said he trusted in his money. In other words, he had a security blanket. And his security blanket was his money, and it was so bad. His trust in that money was so bad, it was going to be difficult to break him away from that. So in this case... Jesus said, you need to give it away. You need to get rid of that security blanket and let me be your blanket. Now, we can substitute ourselves on this story. 
It could be your job. That used to be my security blanket. I've told you that story. And God knew in, a, in you know, my early experience that I had to deal with that, and he helped me do that. You've heard that wonderful story of how he did that, how little faith that I had. He intervened for me. It was a Sabbath issue, and he took care of it. I was amazed. I couldn't believe it. But maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a friend. It could be any of those things that we have a security blanket. You know, security blankets, you know, when I had a granddaughter um, who, uh, in essence, actually was my granddaughter. Carol's here helping me getting the relatives straight because I always mess it up. But anyway, whoever, she was young, and, she, and, and, and her parents were visiting with my sister and her husband, and uh, they were visiting, and they left, and they left about eight hours from Moses Lake, Washington, where we were, to Portland, and they left her security blanket about six hours into the trip. You know what happens when the security blanket's gone? Mothers, you know what happens? It's a nightmare. The world has come to an end. When I was little, I, when I was at Washington Township, I had a little green lunch bucket. George, that was my security blanket. I felt comfortable with my lunch pail. And then one day, I set it out close to the road, and we had some kids around, we were talking, and this big truck comes around the corner, he runs right over it. And I went in there and I looked, and my lunch bucket was flat as a sheet. Oh, I can't tell you the pain, I actually buried that. I mean, oh, man, we all have security blankets and it doesn't end at 12. We have them. We have to have them. Jesus says, you know what? I want to be your security blanket, and that's tough for us. It takes a lifetime of learning to let Jesus be our security blanket. Don't you agree? And so that's the point of our message today. With God, everything is possible. That he saves. And when he saves, he really does. And with this last closing remark, when Jesus was on the cross and we had a man on his left and a man on his right, both criminals, they both, they both at first were mocking him. And finally, one of them was observing Jesus, apparently knew about the trial and knew that this man was innocent. He was impressed how the Lord handled himself on the cross. He said, you know, we deserve what we're getting, but this man's done nothing to deserve this. And he looked over at Jesus and he said this, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus did not hesitate. I tell you this today that you will be with me in my kingdom. What do you think? Is he quite a savior? And it's meant there for you and I. Let us pray. Our Father, we do give thanks for Jesus and his love. What can we say? What can we bring? Not only do we want to be saved in that Holy Spirit that you've given, we want to grow and be good Christian people. We want to represent you the best we can. We don't want to keep your commandments. We want to keep the principles of your commandments being empowered by you and your love. We ask for that help. We need it every day. And if there's some here today that say, you know what, Brother Biggs, I have some issues in my life. You know what, it's okay. Take it to the grace. Take it to the throne of grace. Jesus will gladly receive you. And as we walk on life and we get discouraged, either because of that or whatever situation might be, take it to Christ. Take it in prayer. He cares. He will take care of it. We just got to learn to trust him. And when we see that happening in our life, we will know that it's true. Not only does Jesus save, he is constantly intervening for us. Lord, we give thanks for that, and we ask it in your special name. Amen. Thank you very much.